I'm not a clinician. I never want to be one. It's not my goal or ambition, and I won't proclaim to be one. But I can tell you what can happen if you neglect your mental health. And I can look advisors in the face and talk to the real value about investing in yourself. That's not selfish. That's self-care and taking the time we need. So again, um, I'll follow your here. I'll follow your lead, Eric, with how I should go, maybe going back or explain some of those things. But uh, whenever we neglect ourselves, we're going to be forced to pause. Either we take it when we're ready to do it and we're able to plan it, or our mental health will force us far enough down the road that we'll have to take the time we need. Welcome to the Rockstars Rocking Podcast, powered by Voluntary Disruption, a show dedicated to people who are crushing their business and life goals. These are bite-sized conversations with leading rock stars in their respective industry who are pumped to share their story to help drive you to the next level. So, are you ready to rock? Speaking of rock stars, here's your host, Eric Silverman. Hey, rock stars! Welcome back to another episode of Rock Stars Rockin', where you know it. Come on, you know it by now. I only have the greatest, the finest, the most exceptional rock stars rocking it out in their personal, their business life in every which way possible. And this week, I tell you what, it's no exception. Everybody, please help me welcome my good friend John Troutman, Director of National Marketing and Business Development at M and S E A P. What's up, John? Hey, Eric, thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. Hey, brother, I'm excited to have you on the show. I'm excited for everybody to hear your story. And, you know, John, it's quite the unique story. I mean, I've had the, the pleasure and pri privilege of knowing you for a few years now, becoming friends with you. So I've certainly heard a lot of this, maybe not all of it. We'll find out how much you uh, uh, devolve today. But, um, but I wanted to kind of go back to the past because your background is, is a little bit different. I would say very different than most uh, folks that I meet. Certainly out of, uh, gosh, almost 80 episodes now, by the time this airs, um, we, uh, I, I don't know that I've ever had someone on the show who, uh, who started their career as a pastor. And you went on to be a pastor for uh, the better part of 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me how you, how you got into that and uh, how that uh, was, a, was an incredible segue into the EAP. Uh, for those that don't know EAP, that stands for Employee Assistance Program. Talk about how that led to the EAP world uh, and why you're so passionate about what you do now. Yeah, that's excellent. And thank you so much again, Eric, for the opportunity and just this uh, chance to talk about these things. Uh, sure. Early in life, you know, I've always been all in on people over everything. It's just the way I was raised, the way I was brought up, uh, going to church regularly every week. Uh, my parents were heavily active in the community and in church, and it just seemed like that was the thing that I was called to do, the way God lined up all those planets. Um, and so I became a pastor about the age of 23 years old, right out of college, and stayed at the same place. It's not something that most people do when they go to a place, when they go to a church, is to stay at that same location. It's like a turnover of like four years, and I was there for almost 20. So the hindsight is, you know, I never really dealt with the stress and the pressures, the pressures along the way. Um, I was warned about burnout, but, uh, you know, like a lot of people who are probably even watching this episode, you know, I genuinely cared about people. I never saw them as an individual number. Um, I was advised to do that by people. I just couldn't do that. And through the course of time, almost 20 years of marrying, uh, burying people, uh, taking calls on vacation, not taking breaks, and let's just call it what it, what it was, Eric. I was not heavily involved in self-care. I was heavily involved in my community. I started a lot of projects in the community. We built an athletic field for the community. We did a lot of things that naysayers said couldn't be done that are still being done to this day, but I sacrificed myself by neglecting myself. So um, I did push too hard. So I know, you know, Def Leppard sings that song, it's better to burn out than to fade away. I can't say that that's accurate, you know? So um, it cost me a lot of things. It cost me uh, my reputation, the community, because I was making bad decisions when I was burned out. Like an, like an Air Force pilot, when you're logging too many hours in the air, fatigue factors in. And when you are burned out, you're not making good decisions. Now, 
let me just explain this. I'm not justifying anything I did in the course of my life that was not a good decision. I'm explaining that, you know, these things happen to people because mental health is real. And I was avoiding taking care of myself. I was told before I burned out to take a six month sabbatical by a friend. And I laughed in his face because I loved doing what I was doing. I was investing in people's lives, heavily involved in the community. I was a uh, director of emergency management that was never even had a position or even uh, policies or format in place. So we were doing great things in the community, um, even doing some things for the National Weather Service and the list goes on, but I wasn't taking care of myself until one day, just driving down the road, it was just a major league meltdown. I was just crying for no reason at all. And when you're, you know, I don't care what size man you are, and I know gender is not even a part of the equation, but for me being at that time, 6'5", 285, and just bawling down the, for no reason, I know I needed help. And uh, long story short, I fought to help. I continued to fight to help because I just thought that, uh, you know, mental health was for weak people. And I wasn't a weak person physically, but inside I was destroyed. I was totally destroyed and I just didn't know how to pause. Um, was always raised with a great work ethic. I've been working since I was 11. Um, so the whole concept of stopping to take care of myself was a very foreign concept. And I was burned out. I needed to take that six months. I was asked to take it on a sabbatical. I was forced to take it because I lost my position. And truth be told, I needed to be removed from my position because I wasn't in a good place. And I wasn't wise enough to stop on my own and take the advice from others because it was anxiety attacks. It was, I mean, the list goes on of just, it was a, it was a total severe burnout situation. And um, now people can look at that just where that was. And a lot of my friends in that moment, because I was making these terrible decisions, left me aside, a lot of business contacts left me aside and I had to start over. So that's when I decided I've got to get into sales. Because in all due respect, uh, I was selling concepts in theology. I was, I was selling ideas for people to buy in. Not that I'm trying to water down people who were involved in any form of ministry. I'm not saying that. But I was getting trying to get people to understand and believe what I believed was true and to also buy into that whole concept. So I have always been involved in, in public speaking. Um, at that point in time, shortly thereafter, you know, of, of about... Eight months of counseling, Mazzetti and Sullivan EAP services brought me on as a consultant to present to groups. They knew I was good at public speaking, so they brought me on. This is like 10 years ago now. Uh, they brought me on to uh, support their largest clients and do trainings on various topics. And I started a sales career right out of the gate. It was at a radio station. Um, was working there and uh, selling radio ads and understanding. And it was all part of that learning curve. And I could go on and on to all those different gaps, but these things happen for a reason for me to be where I am today so that I can look employers in the face and talk to them about burnout. I'm not a clinician. I never want to be one. It's not my goal or ambition, and I won't proclaim to be one, but I can tell you what can happen if you neglect your mental health. And I can look advisors in the face and talk to the real value about investing in yourself. That's not selfish. That's self-care and taking the time we need. So again, um, I'll follow your here, I'll follow your lead, Eric, with how I should go, maybe going back or explain some of those things. But uh, whenever we neglect ourselves, we're gonna be forced to pause. Either we take it when we're ready to do it and we're able to plan it, or our mental health will force us far enough down the road that we'll have to take the time we need. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you said a lot there. Let, let's back, let's back step a little bit and unpack some of that because there's a, there's a ton to go over. I just, uh, jotted down a couple quick notes. I appreciate you sharing. So first thing that comes to my mind, um, when you talk about self-care and, and burnout and anxiety and all that stuff, uh, which we absolutely, of course, know is real, uh, at least I do. And you do, I don't know if you're listening and you do, but hopefully we'll convince you. Um, but you know, it reminds me that it's, it's, it's going to sound kind of, kind of cliche, maybe even a little bit silly, but we've all been on airplanes where they say, make sure you put your, uh, the mask on for yourself, self care before you put it on for even your, your child or your husband or your, or your grandmother who can't do it herself. I mean, that's the pure definition of self care. You can't help others unless you help yourself. If you put their mask on first and you don't get to put your mask on, how are you helping anybody? It's very much, I know it's, it's, it's a overused 
example, I believe people use it all the time for various things in life, but I believe it, 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 it's very apropos for this, um, for this situation, for what you described. And, you know, uh, my, um, I've shared this with you before, and some of you may know that are listening, but you know, my wife is a mental health worker. Um, she's a licensed clinical social worker, uh, psychotherapist, uh, private practice. She's been doing this for the better part of 25 years now. And, um, and, and it's, it's more today. She's busier now today than she ever has been. Mm -hmm. And it's not because all of a sudden people, uh, in my opinion, I don't think people need it more now than they even did 20 years ago. I think the need was always there. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the pandemic didn't help. Uh, it actually made it worse and people realized they needed help more. But I believe the need is always there. What's the difference, in my opinion, and this is where my question comes in, I want to I wanna hear your thoughts, is my wife has told me stories about how, and she specializes in uh, kids and young adults and teenagers, and she has some adult patients, but she's seen them for 20 years. So they're adults now. She started with them when they were five or six. Um, she said that now it's kind of, it's going to sound crazy, John, but she said that teenagers now actually think that mental health therapy is the cool thing. You're the cool kid if you have a therapist. Like nowadays in the year 2022, when this is being recorded, um, she has kids that will openly talk about it in public with other kids. And hey, you want to go uh, see a movie later today? Well, I can't. I got to go see my therapist. Hey, you want to, uh, you know, hey, it's uh, we got soccer practice this afternoon. Hey, I'm going to be a little bit late, coach. I got to go see my therapist. Like it's open. It's out there. It's in the public. And she personally believes that it's, and again, this sounds like I'm trivializing and I'm not, but she says it's the cool thing now. Like kids want to talk about things going on in their world. Um, and flashback to when I was a kid, I'm a little bit younger than you, John, flashback to when she was a kid, certainly flashback to when you were a kid. That's not stuff anybody ever talked about. Uh, if you were going to a therapist, um, it was the most secretive thing ever. So uh, what's your thought on that? Like, are you seeing and hearing that in, this, in the same vein? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very valid uh, assessment, and uh, but I think the reality is this, Eric. It, it's if we think about erosion over time, mental health. There's a lot of stigma there. It's a barrier for people to right. use it across the board, and while that stigma is eroding, there are still many places and there are still a lot of uh, areas where it still needs to be eroded and and removed, and it's just going to be through the course of time. It's going to take everybody talking more openly about it. Uh, being more transparent about their own issues. And, and again, I'm not a clinician when I'm about to say this, but I think one of the lies that we've been led to believe in when it comes to mental health is we're, we're supposed to be chasing this normalcy that doesn't exist. Like we're all supposed to not have stress or anxiety. Everybody has sure. stress or anxiety. It's how we handle it. You can't remove it and talk. I mean, if you can, if you can, or someone can remove it from their equation, I'd love to meet them. <laughs> you know, right. it's how we handle it. So um, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm still hearing, in fact, I just said to you, you know, before the show, just two days ago, uh, an athlete reached out to me and said, you know what? I just believe that mental health issues are just for the weak, are people who are weak. Maybe they're weak-minded people, but these are issues you just aren't strong enough to handle, you know, what they got going on. And that could not be, farther from the truth. And there have been Olympians that have come out and talked about mental health, um, national championship teams in every sport that have come out, Super Bowl champions that have come out and talked about it. And yet this stigma is still there. Um, so um, it's great news to hear your wife's story, but I think we need to continue talking about these challenges that we all have to help others who are in denial about mental health challenges. Yeah, no, I mean, you, that story about a, a, a sports athlete um, who says that it, you're weak if you don't, uh, or if you, if you need mental health uh, help, for lack of a better term, um, I mean, I guess uh, everybody's got their opinion. I, 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 that much I respect, but I don't agree um, at all, um, not just because I, I live with somebody in the field, but moreover, we see it every day. Everybody's got ups and downs. Now, I would say, and maybe uh, maybe you'll disagree. I don't know. See if we can get a little controversy going. <laughs> I I believe that that the way you handle stress and anxiety is person to person. Everybody's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, many people are better at handling it than others. Um, mm -hmm. Some people are able to handle it without getting anxious and stressed, and they're able to go about their daily life for their whole life, and uh, nobody knows the wiser. And 
I'm not arguing if that's good or bad. I'm just saying I believe that exists, whereas other people are just not as good at handling it and adapting and therefore uh, counseling and therapy is there for them. Um, do you agree that some people are just better at handling it than others? Yeah, I think, you know, no two people are identical, right? And I think you you hit the nail on the head. And therefore, you know, even in the medical world, you know, our bodies have their own different chemistry at times. And I'm not going to say I'm a pharmacist or anything like that. But in the <laughs> same way of, of mental health, you know, we are all we have a different you know emotional intelligence, how we respond to things, right. our personality, right? I'm a high D and a high I. So I need to be challenged with something and I need someone to be direct with me. Um, as opposed to a more passive way, whereas a different person who's not a D and an I, they, they may need a more indirect method in a way that's a lot softer to handle than a person, you know, in my grill or, or challenging me in a positive way. So yeah, right. I, I believe that's 100% accurate. That's, that's my take. Yeah, I mean, everybody's, everybody's a little bit different. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think that even even people that it appears that they never have bad days again you're probably not behind the scenes with them you know you're not you're not in their household you're not in their their uh, car with them personally each and every second of the day so mm -hmm. everybody handles things a little bit different um so let's let's go back to something you talked about um when you talked about um the um uh you know, there's always a stigma. Uh, there always has been, and there always, uh, sadly, I still believe there will be. Now, I, I, I do agree with my wife in that the stigma is slowly but surely going away. But I don't think I think she would even agree if she was here. I don't think it ever will completely go away. There's still going to be people like that athlete that have that mindset, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, but you know, and you say you say it best. I know you told me um, the other day. Mental health matters, just plain and simple. Mental health matters. Um, and we need to make sure we address it. Um, when you were describing your background, you said that you've always been a people over everything type person. Um, and I, 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 I can't help but bring that up because, um, you know, you and I are part of a, an incredible group of people in uh, our friend Scott McGregor's Talent Champions Council. Uh, give Scott a little plug here. If you're not sure about the Talent Champions Council, I had Scott on the uh, Rockstars Rockin' podcast um, uh, many episodes ago. I don't remember which episode, but uh, check it out. It's in the catalog if you want to take a look. Scott's a good friend of mine, and he runs an organization called the Talent Champions Council. Go to their website uh, if you want to check it out. Um, but his mission statement and is all about, quote unquote, people over everything. Um, what is that phrase? Those, I mean, it's three, let, three words. What does that mean to you? You said it proactively about 10 minutes ago, but kind of dive into that because you've, you've kind of embodied that since the beginning, well before you were in sales. Yeah. And just giving to the community, being, you know, being all in um, what's best for them without expecting anything back. You know, we live in a society where a lot of people will give necessarily with a purpose in mind of receiving something. And, you know, you and I both are, are wired in such a way that we, we enjoy being of value to people in business and life. And, um, I, I was raised that way in a home. My parents uh, were heavily involved in a volunteering, whether it was in the community, whether it was in the local church, uh, people who were without a home for a period of time ended up staying with us. So I saw that firsthand. My grandmother, when she had Alzheimer's, wasn't sent to a facility. And I'm not, you know, judging or condemning anybody who does that. But I was raised that you, you bring those people in, you do what you can to put others before your own self. So um, that was just drained into me day in, day out. And it was normal to me. So uh, I also learned to enjoy that earlier on in life. So, uh, you know, when you enjoy helping people before yourself, um, and, and that was, let's just call it what it was, too much of any one thing can be a challenge, right? It can be, um, if you're not, because if you're neglecting yourself, so I'm not condemning the people over everything, we just can't exclude ourselves from that equation. So um, that's been a big part of my path. It's who I am today. And that's what made, quite frankly, Eric, it's so much easier for me to transition into sales because I never looked at myself as a salesperson. I looked at myself as a solution provider, um, finding pains in people's lives and businesses and providing those solutions. The sales took care of themselves. So let's, uh, let, let's dive in a little bit to, to sales and, and you transitioning from, um, from, from being a pastor for the better part or nearly 20 years into, um, into sales. I know you had a couple, 
segues into a couple different avenues and technology and so forth. But but the the meat of it, where you've been for the better part of the last eight years almost, um, is at MNS EAP Services. Again, I said it earlier, EAP. Uh, for those that don't know, I, I suspect anybody listening does know EAP stands for Employee Assistance Program. You know, my um, as a benefits person by trade, I've been in the benefits world for 23 years. I always looked at an EAP as um, as uh, 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 not, and I'm just I'll follow my own sword. I didn't understand it um, to the to the degree that I understand it today. Um, I didn't I didn't really get it. It didn't click for me. Uh, you know, and I can be the first to admit it. And I guess my question is, is, is that the norm? Like, do you still see advisors and brokers and consultants out there that aren't realizing the powerful uh, need of an EAP with an employer group for employees to help them? Uh, is it hopefully getting a little bit better like myself, where I now understand it more over the last many years? Uh, what, what's been your, um, what are you seeing out there in the marketplace? Yeah, Eric, those are, those are some great points. And again, I want to defend all of the advisors out there because in the world of EAP, uh, my competitors and I, we all use the same words, but they mean different things. Throw into the mix that oftentimes it's a benefit that gets tucked away in another plan and it's not at the forefront. It's not on the front page of your benefit package. So, Well, that, that, that's the point right there. I mean, I've always seen EAPs just and, you know, my, my buddy Dave Contorno would argue nothing's free, and I get that. But it's always tucked in for, quote, unquote, free mm -hmm. uh, under a, uh, a, an employer-funded life or an employer-funded long-term disability plan. And nobody ever talks about it. It's buried in the, in the paperwork. It's on page nine out of nine. Mm -hmm. um, and most employers will, will add in that product, and they won't even realize they mm -hmm. have an EAP. And therefore, none of the employees see that they or know that they have an EAP. So... Um, that I think is why I probably never really paid much attention to it. And again, I'm falling on my own sword. Don't write right. hate mail to me. I'm just, I'm being very honest and open. Um, and that's not how it should be done. Right. And it's, there's a broad brush out there. I mean, the, the, the words are, are used, uh, you know, from a, from a standalone robust plan to something that's very weak. And that's why it's so important for advisors, especially right now, because the awareness is coming out there for mental health needs. A lot of employers are relooking and rethinking about mental health and wanting to retain those employees by getting that quality benefit uh, of an employee assistance program. So words like session, what is that? Who is that with? What is the time frame? Is it an hour long? Is it 30 minutes? Uh, the time is a, is a big part. Is that a face-to-face -face or over the phone? What does that look like? And what is the what is the quality of the person they're going to be meeting with? Is it a is it a person with a license? And if so, what does that mean? Where, where did they or how did they get that license? Or is it a master degree clinician? So those types of questions and understanding the terminologies, not to mention utilization, right? What does that word mean? You know, and we get a better understanding of that because there's a lot of different numbers out there. So understanding the world of EAP better can really get a better plan in place, which many times leads to better utilization. You know, we want our clients to know the benefit is there. We want it to be used. We want that utilization to be higher, way higher than average um, so that they get a successful utilization and they see it across their company, it improves their culture. So help out. I mean, a lot of the, the folks that, that listen to the Rockstars Rockin' podcast these days are in the employee benefits insurance um, world, for lack of a better term. Um, so help us out. Talk about... Um, in big picture words here, talk about what uh, a true EAP should mean, what the definition of is in your opinion, and what advisors and brokers should look for. Yeah, absolutely. Guys listening, ladies listening, call John, he'll help you out. MS is fantastic. But forget that for a moment. Just in general, what yeah. are some things they should be looking for? What are some questions they should be asking of their current EAP providers? Yeah, again, I'll just leave by saying this. This is not meant in any way to be, you know, driving traffic, you know, to my LinkedIn site or for sales. This is simply for quality and mental health services. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to mental health, especially, you don't know what a person could be dealing with. Uh, I think any EAP provider deals with life-threatening situations, whether it's the person or they could be harming someone else. Mm -hmm. I think it is imperative in those solutions that they can get a live person. Because if that person is about to harm themselves or someone else, they're not thinking clearly 
and then not being able to talk to a live person on the other end could lead to a worse outcome than if they were able to speak with a live person. Better outcomes can happen. So I think those robust plans that are out there to know that when you dial the phone, you will get a live person is huge so that you can get that immediate assistance for those cases that are severe. Now, so John, hold on one second and don't try not to forget that last train of thought, but you're talking about having a live person to speak to right away. What's the alternative? What do you see out there in the marketplace that's happening? I mean, I'm not sure. I'm really asking, is it sure. is it artificial intelligence? Is it bots? Is it just text messaging back and forth? Like, what are you seeing that a lot of EAP companies are starting to do as opposed to what you recommend? Well, I think, again, with uh, all that took place and all that continues to go on around the country with COVID and all those different protocols, a lot of EAPs went strictly to a a uh, virtual platform. And I'm not condemning that in any way, shape, or form. That's a right. huge benefit to be able to talk to a person. And I'm not saying that that's negative, but uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, our competitors go to, to platforms where it's strictly technology-based. Oh, okay. Um, where, you may not, where you may not be engaging a live person at all. Again, if you're able to engage a live person on a, on a virtual platform, that's great. But uh, I think it's concerning for those individuals in particular who could be at the, the place of harming themselves, but they've used their EAP instead of 911, right. will, will they get the help they need? And I'm just going to say, I don't know in every case that's the, that's the situation. So okay. um, technology does have its limitations and the benefit of speaking with a live person who is qualified you know, and caring to handle that immediate situation is a, is a game changer. You know, to, to protect that person, to protect the home uh, of a person in the most severe cases. Now, Eric, you and I both know it should ever, it should never get to that point. EAPs should be used in a preventative measure long before those things happen. But the reality is, people often wait until things have collapsed, and now they're they're reaching out in a in a moment of last resort. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, look the the. I, if somebody's going through a, a, a terrible time and sadly it's happening every second of every day, um, I, I think you're spot on to be able to call up and speak to a live person. I mean, again, I keep going back to, I just, this topic happens to resonate because I, I live with somebody um, who, um, who does it for a living. Um, there's not, there's not a week that goes by where she's not on the phone, literally with the phone to her ear on her Bluetooth headset talking somebody down from the ledge, maybe not quote unquote suicide, um, which is good, but talking them down from the ledge on something else crazy, uh, mm-hmm. something stupid they're about to do. It mm-hmm. could be anything. It could be just hurting themselves, could be hurting others. Um, it could be um, doing uh, something uh, illegal. I mean, there's, I, I can't even, I can't share of course, but I can't tell you how many crazy things, uh, and I don't use that term loosely, but just things that the average person can't fathom that a mental health worker like my wife and those on your uh, in your EAP team here day to day hour to hour every single um every single uh year so um it's just a, uh, it, it couldn't be uh, it couldn't be more true uh if you tried um let me ask you about some differentiators so when you're when you're talking to an advisor or a broker or a consultant and you're out there saying um, you know, uh, you're, you're up against uh, some stiff competition in the EAP world. What are some things that differentiate m and EAP um, that, uh, that really stand out and, and allow you to capture, capture business? Because I'll be honest, what really stands out for me, uh, John, is you. You know, people buy from people they like, know, and trust, and respect. And, um, you know, I've had many... Um, things that I've quote unquote sold or placed as an employee benefits advisor over the years. And if, and when that person leaves, um, for whatever reason, I don't do as much business with that firm anymore. It's interesting because it's not because the firm is, is that much worse or that much better per se. It's just my connect is gone and the relationship is what mattered. And, um, and let's face it, we're in a relationship world. So, you know, in my opinion, anybody that works with MNS EAP, uh, when you're working directly with John, that's, uh, that's the, that's the best part of the scenario right there. But when you get down into the nitty gritty and you're checking off the bullet points, what are some actual things that, that really, um, set MNS apart from any other, um, uh, uh, competitor in the space? 
Well, first off, I really appreciate those kind words. Uh, it's very humbling to hear them, actually, but uh, that means a lot, Eric. Uh, but one of the things that people need to realize is I am just merely the tip of the spear. One of the things that has been a challenge in my previous sales positions has been the inconsistencies, the where you would be marketing a product, but yet the operations or the service piece wasn't the same. One of the things that I love knowing is my team has my back. What I mean by that is there's going to be the consistency and that persistency to build a relationship with that new client. So every group gets a dedicated person because we are built to be a business partner, not just to be a checkbox vendor. And that's really the different, especially right now when people are dealing with different challenges, we get calls literally every week from our clients saying, you know what, I'm dealing with, you know, fill in the blank. Can you help me out? It, it's not always a yes and here's a solution. Oftentimes it's a, let's figure this out. We are in it for the business relationship and we get involved in a lot of things that have nothing to do with typical EAP solutions, but we're that business partner. Maybe it's introducing them to a strategic partner like yourself or, or someone else, but that's who we are. We are there to, we're all in for our clients to help them in business to be the most successful that they can be and in life as well. And that's, I think a differentiator when we're not just looking for a person to know that we're there and to avoid utilization, we're truly trying to drive it. And that can go many different ways and oftentimes outside of typical EAP solutions. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the we're, all that we're talking about is really, it, it boils down back, it, it goes back to, to people, right? Uh, it goes back to, um, Frankly, it goes back to things that we were, uh, a lot of us were taught by our parents and grandparents as little kids. You know, what's the, what's the saying, John? Treat people the way you want to be treated. Yeah. Isn't, I mean, exactly. I know that sounds really, really, really um, dumbed down, but isn't that really what it's all about? Treat people the way you want to be treated. Uh, if you want to be treated a certain way, um, don't ever think that somebody else isn't thinking the same thing. Um, you know, nobody likes to be in pain whether it's uh, uh, mental or physical or both. So, uh, no, I, I think that's a big deal. Um, and I, I'm just glad you're out there preaching the gospel and talking about it constantly. Uh, and I'm glad, too, for those that aren't following John on social media, on LinkedIn uh, specifically, um, change that right away. Connect with him. Uh, if you don't connect, at least follow his, um, his page. Um, he posts um, throughout the week constantly, which is fantastic. It's very active. He's built his own personal brand within m and but moreover, um, you know, he's a human being, guys. Um, so most, I don't want to say all, but most, in my opinion, most of your posts are um, shout outs to others and, and, you're, um, and you're talking about yourself in, a, in, in not a narcissistic way. I, I want to be clear. You're talking about it in an open and honest and transparent, authentic way where you'll say, hey, guys, you know, I needed a break today. I was, I've been running and gunning for the last um, two weeks. And today I decided to take this day off and do this or uh, or whatever it might be. Maybe it was a, maybe you at the gym, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's very uh, important that everybody realizes that you're, um, you're not only uh, preaching the message, but you're living it. You're, you're, you're talking about it daily. And I think that's, that's the most important. Um, John, you, you and I are big baseball fans. Uh, and I love your story. You mentioned earlier uh, in the show that you, um, you help put together a, a, a sports complex, but I'd love for you to dig a little bit deeper because um, the uh, you told me a story about how it was kind of sort of uh, like a field of dreams moment. Can you share with me um, how that came about and and the pushback you kept getting? Yeah. So when I was a pastor, we had a uh, we were surrounded by farmland and several acres, uh, well over ten acres, and uh, one of the large areas was a was a hilly section of a soybean field. And, uh, you know, one of the challenges in our community, and I know this can uh, be very meaningful to you, Eric, was a shortage of athletic fields. You know, we had we a lot of kids every day. Yeah, we had a lot of kids in the community, but they had no place to play soccer, baseball, you know, you name it. And, you know, I went to the, the rest of the board at the church and said, you know, what if we could build a field here uh, from this field, build a baseball field, an athletic field for the community. And they allowed me to do some research on it. And. Um, took several years, took meeting with the community, getting a lot of those codes and, you know, building and all of that uh, blueprints and everything in place. But uh, through the course of about three and a half years, we converted that soybean field 
into a FIFA-like soccer field and a field large enough to play Little League Baseball on. So um, there was a lot of pushback from a few number of people who thought this is just going to be grown over in weeds in a, a number of years. Um, it's never really going to be utilized. We're never going to make any money out of this field. Um, you know, and the list goes on. Uh, from the Now, we brought in uh, a Major League Baseball player, Sid Green at the time, who was playing, I believe, for the uh, Atlanta Braves, came and, and, you know, opened up the day. But that field to this day is being utilized every single day that it possibly could be used. I know there's a school district that's using that, that soccer field for their high school team because they didn't have enough usage at their own uh, at their own facility to have another team. So uh, we were very passionate back then about being involved in the community. And it was extremely fulfilling because we built it and they came, you know, yeah. um, th that was great to be a part of something to see kids have a place to go uh, as opposed to being limited to one opportunity a week to practice and then another opportunity to have one game um, they could get more time in. And that time, as you well know, Eric, that time investing in kids in an athletic team has more to do with coaching them in life than it does about that specific sport. So yeah. um, seizing those opportunities to invest in people's lives, especially younger people, um, they're going to be the next generation of leaders. So it was wonderful to be a part of that. You will never see my name on that. And I'm glad you drive past that field, but I am very passionate to know that we got it done and we invested in people. Well, you know, I mean, unless you tell me I'm wrong, it's not like where you put the fields is surrounded by a retirement uh, uh, community. It's not like you're in South Florida uh, or mid Florida where everybody's uh, going and flying to retire where there's no kids. Okay. Even that, I would argue, you still need a field for all the grandkids that are going to visit. But I digress. The reality is, it's a you're you're not in the middle of nowhere per se. You're in a growing area. Families are there. They're going to continue to um, have families. Um, fields are always in need. I deal with it every day. I'm a uh, head coach for my daughter's softball team. I'm a coach for my son's baseball team. My wife is a head coach for two different soccer teams for my wife at, or for my daughter and my my son. Um, and field space is always at a premium. It really is. Um, and I feel like we live in a nice area. And uh, I feel like uh, our community and township and city, they quote unquote, have a little bit of money, but it's still tough to get them to, to fix the fields and, and keep them updated and so forth. So uh, just like you would know, uh, you've done it. Uh, most times it's coaches rolling up their sleeves and raking the fields and getting them prepped and making sure that we don't just rely on the city or the county or whomever it might be. Can't imagine it's any different where you're at. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So, uh, John, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's been a pleasure. Uh, for those of you that aren't already connected with John, again, I'll repeat, uh, find him on LinkedIn. It's John Troutman, Trout Like the Fish, man, John Troutman. Uh, he is the National Marketing and Business Development Director at MNS EAP um, and uh, out of Harrisburg, but they're a national firm. They're everywhere. And uh, John, what's your, uh, what's your company's website if anyone wants to check that out? Yeah, mseap.com. Uh, lots of great, great resources there. You can also reach out to me that way as well. Perfect, perfect. Uh, John, thank you for coming on. And, uh, and thank you, everybody listening, everybody watching on YouTube, listening on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, I appreciate it, of course. If you have any questions, thoughts, comments, ideas for next shows, if you have any questions for John, please drop them in the comment section below wherever you are listening or watching today's show. Um, and uh, as I always say, I, I got to give credit where credit's due. I just show up and have a bunch of fun and, and ask some fun questions and, and mix and mingle and, and shoot the breeze with some friends and some new friends uh, on the show each week. But I don't do all the editing and all the back office stuff that has to get done to get it up on the podcast platform. So for everybody, and there's an army, for everybody behind the scenes at the Rockstars Rockin' Podcast, I'm Eric Silverman. That, everybody, is, was, and always will be John Troutman. And until next week, don't just have a good week. Make it a good week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Rockstars Rocking Podcast. If you haven't done so already, make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you consume podcasts. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a review. Five stars would totally rock. Until next time, rock stars, keep rocking.